La Fiesta Brava, or the Brave Festival, is an iconic event in Spanish culture where matadors pit themselves against hundreds of raging bulls, one set of horns at a time. They risk their lives every time they evade the bull's lethal horns, and it's considered a cultural art form representing the battle between the intelligence of man and the power of the beast. But even the most skilled matadors can't always escape unscathed. In 2019 alone, 175 injuries were inflicted on matadors, gored by the bull's horns or injured in other ways. And though the fate of the matador is in their own hands, the bull, who has no choice in this, is horrifically destined to be slain by the matador's sword almost every time. And that would have been the case for one bull in Barcelona if it weren't for the interference of an unlikely French farmer. Would this farmer manage to tame the raging bull, or would he suffer the same gruesome injuries as a matador? Well, you're going to want to stick around to see how this story unfolded, because I promise you're not going to believe what happened. Now, to really understand the truth about the sport of bullfighting, we need to step into the shoes, or the hooves, of the bull. In Spanish-style bullfighting, the Toro Bravo, or Spanish Fighting Bull, are cattle bred specifically for the fights. Descended from the wild bulls of the Iberian Peninsula, they're prized for their aggression, strength, energy, and stamina, the perfect challenger for a matador. At the age of one, they're separated from their mothers. At two, their behavioral traits are tested. For the males, this establishes whether they're suitable for the bullring or for breeding. They're pitted against a horse to see if they instinctively show aggression and endurance. If they do, they pass. If not, they're sold off then and there for meat. However, even if they pass, it's still not sunshine and rainbows at this stage of their life. They might still be gored by another over-aggressive male in their pen. There's no place these bulls are safe. Young females are also tested. Though they'll never fight, they may be selected for breeding, as it's essential for breeders that both parents are aggressive in order to prevent any softening of the resulting calf's temperament. If the female fails the test, she too will be sold off for meat. And even if she's chosen for breeding, the day she stops producing calves, it's off to the abattoir. That's one heck of a baby shower. At just four years old, the successful males are deemed ready to fight. They must have fully functional vision, both horns, and weigh at least 903 pounds. If not, then, well, you guessed it, off to the meatpackers they go. But becoming steak is arguably a kinder fate than what awaits them in the ring. The matador, who's specifically trained to fight bulls in the most crowd-pleasing ways possible, slowly hacks away at the creature. The bull is struck with swords, pierced by lances, and shot at with barbed harpoons. For some viewers, it's entertainment. For others, it's agonizing just to watch. And even if the bull manages to best the matador, other bullfighters will rush into the ring and take the bull down. The only way the bull can survive is if it's pardoned, an exceptionally rare ruling meaning it's shown outstanding bravery in the ring. It'll be retired to green pastures for the last 20 years of its life for breeding, if it survives its injuries. But some bulls don't ever stand a chance of making it that far. As pre-show entertainment, baby bulls, taken from their mothers, are regularly brought into the ring, goaded by matadors, and eventually slaughtered for entertainment. While traditional, the slaying of a baby animal in front of spectators is chilling, to say the least. However, in a very uncommon mercy of fate, one bull, rescued by French farmer Christophe Thomas, was spared the horrors of such an existence when he was saved at a mere four months old. Considering bulls even this young can be slaughtered in the ring, a fighting bull's best hope is that it be rescued before it's swept up into the industry. And that's exactly what Christophe did. When Christoph was a young boy, he saw a mural in a local bar depicting a matador in an arena, waving down a bull. He first believed the pair were playing, but then Christoph discovered the shocking truth. They were fighting, and the bull would almost certainly die. After that, 
he vowed that he would one day save a fighting bull from this horrific fate no matter what it took. Thirty years later, Kristoff began his hunt. Because of the big business a prized bull can bring in for a breeder, almost all of them refused to give him a male calf. Almost. Eventually, after a long and arduous search, Kristoff found a breeder willing to sell him one. At just under four months old, the little thing still required bottle feeding. It was a baby, one that otherwise would have been destined to die at the hands of a matador. Kristoff set to work building the bull its own special pen and named it Fajin. From the start, Kristoff remained cautious of Fajin. Even though Fajin was still a young calf, he was growing rapidly into a mature bull who would soon be strong enough to lift cars. Aware of the danger, Kristoff took extra precautions whenever he was around Fajin. He was especially careful whenever entering Fajin's pen. But Kristoff believed bulls were more than just scary beasts bred for fighting in the arenas, and so he gave Fajin freedom to mingle with the other animals on his farm. Like any youngster, it soon became apparent that Fajin just wanted to play. And then, when he was just eight months old, he did something that shocked Kristoff. He responded to his name. Fajin! From there, the pair's bond developed. Kristoff began playing with Fajin himself, buying him a big ball they could play with back and forth. He'd call Fajin over and give the cute calf a good brushing, which he really enjoyed. This baby bull was just like a big dog. But Kristoff knew this might not last forever. He was getting bigger by the day, and there might come a time where he wasn't always this gentle because of the way he'd been bred. But incredibly, that day never came. Despite his huge size, the two bonded over many years, constantly playing and goofing around together. Fajin was extremely gentle and affectionate with Kristoff, always nuzzling him, hugging him, or planting a wet lick on his cheek. Fajin also befriended the other farm residents. The goats would ride on his back and use him as a taxi service across the field. Kristoff would even fearlessly wear a red shirt in front of Fajin, a color believed to enrage bulls into a frenzy, though in reality, that's a myth. Bulls are red-green colorblind, so they can't actually see the color red to begin with. In the arena, bulls are agitated by the matador flapping his cape. They see it as a challenge and charge. And to be fair, if a guy kept swatting a napkin at me, I'd want to headbutt him too. Though in the beginning he may have feared mortal injury from this supposedly beastly bred bull, these days Kristoff can literally ride on Fajin's horns. The bull himself seems more than happy to give his best buddy a lift. A stark contrast to the bull ring, where horns have not only gored but slain matadors. Meanwhile, Fajin and Kristoff live in harmony. Perhaps there is a lesson to learn here about the true nature of bulls. They're not all raging, aggressive beasts. They can be gentle and loving as well. And Kristoff certainly proved that bulls make better friends than fighters. He's even begun campaigning with Fajin to ban bullfighting in France. Because every year around the world, it's estimated that around 250,000 bulls tragically lose their lives in bullfights. Thanks to Kristoff, Fajin escaped this fate. And the two ended up forming the friendship of a lifetime. Did you see that twist coming? If so, give it a thumbs up. If not, let me know down in the comments what you thought was going to happen next. Now, Fajin isn't the only lucky animal to have been saved by a human hero, and some of the ways these animals have thanked their saviors will really pull on your heartstrings. Pick up a penguin. It was just an ordinary day for retired bricklayer Jao Pereira de Sousa back in 2011. He was taking a stroll on the beach near his house on Ilha Grande, an island off the coast of Rio de Janeiro, when he stumbled across a strange, oily black lump. The lump started to move and then let out a loud squawk. Zhao picked it up and discovered the lump was in fact a Magellanic penguin. The poor little penguin had been caught in an oil spill and was completely soaked in the stuff. His feathers had stuck together meaning he'd lost his natural buoyancy and couldn't swim. Zhao took the penguin back to his home and spent hours washing off the bird's oil-slicked feathers. Over the next few days, he fed the penguin a steady diet of fish to rebuild its strength. He named it Dindim. 
After a few weeks, the penguin had almost completely recovered. So, Zhao took Din Din out on his boat to release him back into the ocean. A good deed, well done. Except that wasn't the end of Din Din's story. A few days later, Zhao heard a loud squawk in his back garden. Unbelievably, Din Din had returned, and he wanted more fish. Zhao welcomed his little friend back, gave him a few fresh sardines, and Din Din stayed by Zhao's side for another 11 months. The little bird was a fun roommate, and Zhao clearly didn't mind the constant fish breath. But then, just after Din Din had shed his winter coat, he disappeared. The penguin had finally returned to the wild. Or had he? A few months passed when one day Zhao heard another loud squawk in his back garden. Din Din had returned once again, and Zhao was thrilled to see his old roommate waddling up to greet him. This pattern would continue over the years. Din Din would disappear into the ocean for a few months and then return to spend time with Zhao. It had been suggested that Din Din's natural instincts sent him on a 5,000-mile journey to participate in the breeding season on the Patagonia coast. However, this has been disputed by biologists, who argue such a journey would be far too perilous for a lone penguin to make. Between sharks, seals, and turbulent ocean currents, Din Din would face a whole heap of challenges. But who knows, maybe this little penguin is pluckier than we think. Scientists have instead theorized Din Din spends several months fishing in the sea, though, quite frankly, nobody knows for sure. The only one who knows what Din Din gets up to when he's away is Din Din. He could be off providing voice work for Happy Feet 3 for all we know. One thing is for sure, he always returns to Ilya Grande to spend time with Zhao. In the wild, Magellanic penguins pair for life and form strong bonds with their family. In this case, Din Din has imprinted on Zhao, so no matter where he goes, he sees the old bricklayer as his family and returns to his village year after year to visit. Croc and Roll If you're ever paddling down a river and spot a floating log, well, you better be careful, because it could be a crocodile. These scaly monsters are the last living descendants of the dinosaurs and have had a millennia to perfect their ambush hunting techniques. They lurk in the water, lying in wait for their prey. And when creatures draw too near, they strike. A crocodile's bite strength is unbelievable, delivering 3,000 pounds of force per square inch. Meanwhile, even the largest sharks only have a bite force of 350 pounds per square inch. However, despite possessing these mighty jaws, crocodiles can't chew. Instead, they tear chunks off their prey and swallow them whole. With all that in mind, it's no surprise that anyone's first reaction to stumbling across a crocodile would be to get out of there fast. But when Costa Rican fisherman Gilberto Chito Shedden discovered a wounded crocodile lying on the riverbank, his reaction was, unbelievably, the total opposite. He decided to nurse it back to health. The crocodile had been shot through the left eye by a local cattle farmer who feared that the croc was preying on his livestock but Chito thought it deserved a second chance. He named the crocodile Pocho, brought the massive croc back to his house, and fed it 66 pounds of chicken and fish every week. He even mimed the action of chewing in order to encourage the crocodile to eat. Little did he know, Pocho couldn't actually chew, but somehow the mime worked and the crocodile regained his appetite. Eventually, he released Pocho back to the wild, but the next morning, he walked out onto the veranda, only to find Pocho lying there, waiting for him. From then on, Chito would talk to his crocodilian buddy, sleep beside him, and even kiss him on the snout. Now, I know what you're thinking. Pocho was merely biding its time, restoring its strength until he could have a tasty, Chito-sized snack. But impossibly, the crocodile returned Chito's affections. Whenever Chito entered the water, the crocodile would rush towards him. Terrifying, right? Except, instead of taking a chunk out of Chito, Pocho would perk up his snout for a kiss. The bond between the pair was so strong, Chito's wife began feeling like a third wheel in their marriage and left him. Honestly, I can't blame her. If someone brought a crocodile into my house, I'd leave the country. 
Nevertheless, Chito remained fearful that Costa Rican authorities would confiscate Pocho, and so he hid the crocodile in a secret pond in a nearby forest. But even with Chito's secrecy, the two were eventually spotted swimming together and reported to the authorities. However, instead of blowing their cover, this shot the pair to superstardom. News outlets and locals descended upon Chito's humble shack, fascinated by the friendship between man and crocodile, broadcasting Chito and Pocho's story across the world. The two became local celebrities, and over the next 10 years, the pair would perform a weekly act in the water for tourists in their local town of Siquires. Eventually, Pocho died of natural causes in 2011. He's estimated to have been 60 years old and was given a grand funeral, with Chito holding his claw throughout the entire ceremony. His taxidermized remains are now on display at the Siquieres Town Museum. Though his legend lives on, forever remembered fondly as Chito's scaly friend. Now, before you go wading into your local swamp or river and thinking you can befriend a crocodile, you should remember that Pocho had been shot in the head. It's likely that the original gunshot wound gave Pocho brain damage, altering his natural behavior to such an extent he became dependent on Chito. Or maybe Chito just has a way with crocodiles. After all, he is currently training a new crocodile called Pocho 2. Though, how this new friendship will pan out is uncertain. I certainly wouldn't be kissing those jaws. King of Chelsea Harrods is an upscale department store located in one of the most notoriously expensive districts in the UK, Knightsbridge. Over the years, Harrods has sold some incredible items, from carved crystal bathtubs to a diamond golf club, and even a pair of ruby slippers. But back in the 1960s, one thing up for sale was even more wild. Just ask friends Ace Bork and John Rendell who went into the store in 1969 and found a lion cub for sale. The cub was kept at Herod's Pet Kingdom, alongside tigers, camels, and panthers, all of which were available to purchase. President Ronald Reagan even rung up to ask about buying a baby elephant. But it wasn't as glamorous as it seemed on the surface. Exotic animals like these were ripped from the wild, often kept in cramped cages before being put out on display in store aisles. Newborn cubs were separated from their mothers. The crying cubs then paraded around potential customers. The cruel practice was later banned in the UK by the 1976 Endangered Species Act, which put a stop to a variety of exotic animals being sold. Looking down at this little lion cub, John and Ace had a funny feeling they could give it a better life free from its small cage. So they decided to take the gamble of a lifetime. They bought the lion cub for the equivalent of $3,700 in today's money and took the cub home to live with them in their apartment, naming it Christian. The lion cub would join them at work in their furniture store, Sophisticat, where Christian fit right in. He would stalk around the chairs and tables as if it were an indoor jungle. But even the large furniture store didn't provide enough space for Christian to roam. So every day, John took him to the local church grounds for exercise. Except Christian kept getting bigger, and their apartment was starting to get seriously cramped. But John and Ace hadn't forgotten their promise to give Christian a better life. They knew that a furniture store could never be a forever home for the king of the jungle. So, following a chance meeting with actors Virginia McKenna and Bill Travers, stars from the movie Born Free, the four came up with a plan. Just like in the famous movie, they were going to set Christian free. John, Ace, and Christian flew out to Kenya, where they met with a lion conservationist, John Adamson. The plan was to slowly introduce Christian to the wild at the Kora National Park, but Christian reclaimed his wild instincts straight away growling and stalking horned cows, it was clear that Christian had finally found his way home. With heavy hearts, John and Ace returned to London, but a year later came back to visit Christian. George informed them that Christian had established his own pride, with three females and a male. The Sophisticat Lion had become a roaring success in the savannah. 
However, George warned John and Ace that it was unlikely Christian would remember them as he had fully assimilated into the wild. Nevertheless, three days later, Christian appeared. He stopped and stared at them before bounding over like an excited little cub again. The giant 500-pound big cat jumped up, embracing them each in a big cat hug while trying to sit on their laps. Christian hadn't forgotten the men that had rescued him from that department store and returned him home to Africa. John and Ace spent nine days in Kenya, with Christian introducing them to his pride of lionesses and cubs. Eventually, they headed back to London while Christian moved on to the nearby Meru National Park, where his descendants still live today. Jungle Jim if you were ever to venture deep into the depths of the Amazon jungle, one of the most dangerous animals you could come across is a jaguar. These big cats can swim, climb, and sprint at speeds up to 50 miles per hour, so there's little chance of you escaping one, unless you run like Usain Bolt with a rocket up his butt, and if one were to catch you, then their teeth could crush your skull. Jaguars have the strongest jaws of any big cats, delivering a monstrous 1,500 pounds of force per square inch. However, as lethal as jaguars are, these big cats face an even greater threat, poachers. Between 2012 and 18, at least 1,000 jaguars were poached, and their spotted hides sold to international buyers. In particular, there is a high demand for jaguar jewelry in China, with necklaces carved from the big cat's teeth. Yikes, what a pointlessly morbid accessory. As the result of this high demand for poached jaguar products, many cubs are tragically orphaned. These cubs lack the skills to hunt for food or survive on their own, and without their mother's care, many starve and perish. And that would have been the case for one jaguar cub until some unlikely rescuers arrived. The J-Team though they may better be known as the Jungle Warfare Training Center, a military organization based in Manaus. This center is designed to train troops to be able to survive in the harsh conditions of the jungle. And on one of the soldiers' expeditions, they stumbled across an orphaned jaguar cub. The poor cub was weak, starving from the severe lack of food. The soldiers knew they couldn't just leave it as that would mean certain death by the hands of poachers. So they brought the baby cub back to their barracks. From there, they raised it as one of their own, calling it Sergeant Spots. Only kidding, they named it Jiquitea. And knowing jaguars love the water, the soldiers took Jiquitea for daily swims. Even when this little cub had grown into a 260-pound big cat, they still took her for daily swims, which she clearly adored. Good thing heavy objects feel lighter in the water. Today, Jikatea resides in the Manaus Military Zoo, a sanctuary for other jungle animals such as monkeys, sloths, and tapirs that have been illegally removed from their natural rainforest habitats. And Jikatea keeps busy as the spokescat for jaguars in the Amazon, a project led by the Brazilian army to promote species preservation and combat illegal poaching. Across the board, the Jungle Warfare Training Center is a fierce advocate for jaguars, having adopted the animal as their symbol. Successful cadets of the center's training programs are even awarded a jaguar-headed bowie knife on graduation. Wow, they really stuck to the jaguar theme. The Jungle Warfare Training Center definitely understood the assignment. Feathered Friends There's no creature quite as elegant as a swan. With their pristine white feathers and slender necks, they look so graceful gliding through the water. However, if you've ever walked along a footpath near a pond, you know how downright evil they can be. Hissing, biting, and even launching aerial attacks. Some swans can even torpedo after you, flying at speeds of up to 50 miles per hour. Some swan attacks are so deadly that there have been multiple reports of swans breaking people's bones. One man in Ireland had his leg broken by a swan after he picked a fight and lost. Swans are some seriously mean birds. But underneath that tough exterior, there's a heart of gold, 
and you'd be surprised who managed to befriend these hostile birds. Television host Richard Wise was visiting the Abbotsbury Swannery when he came across an injured swan. The downed bird had been hurt after flying into a chain-link fence. Not wanting to abandon the animal, Richard used soothing words to calm the bird. Hello, how are you? You are calm. You are sleeping. Before attempting to pick it up. After all, even with its injuries, the swan could still unleash some serious damage. Richard brought the swan to the sanctuary where it received treatment for its injuries. Upon his return to the sanctuary some time later, the swan remembered its savior and unbelievably leaned in for a hug. The swan wrapped its own neck around Richard's, which is seen as a sign of total trust. It's a heartfelt moment that became a hilarious one once you realize Richard is modeling the real-life version of Bjork's infamous Oscar dress. Now, that's a blast from the past. But Richard isn't the only man to have befriended one of these frosty birds. Retired Turkish postman Recep Mirzan was taking a shortcut in his car when he spotted a swan with a broken wing lying in an empty field. Recep pulled the car over and slowly approached the swan. Concerned that the animal may be killed by predators, he decided to take the swan back to his farm and nurse it back to health. He named the swan Garip, which translates to bizarre, but is also used colloquially to describe those who are down on their luck. A fitting name for this injured swan. After it recovered, Recep was ready to release the swan back into the wild. But Garib had other ideas, instead choosing to start accompanying Recep on his chores around the farm and his evening walks. A widower with no children, Recep remains grateful for Garib's company an astonishing 38 years later, and now thinks of Garib like a child he never had. In case you didn't know, swans mate for life and can be exceptionally loyal to their partners. So it goes to show that if you offer them a little kindness, then you could have a little swan buddy for life. Or a broken arm. Depends on what mood the swan's in, I guess. Ice Ice Baby When it comes to dealing with bears, the saying goes, Black, fight back. Brown, get down. White, good night. That's because polar bears are the biggest and meanest of all the bear species. Ten times as strong as a human, polar bears can shift half a ton icebergs without breaking a sweat and can swim at speeds of up to six miles per hour. But polar bears aren't just the biggest bears in the world, they're also the hungriest. Their habitat in the Arctic Circle is a frozen wasteland with sparse vegetation, meaning these roving carnivores are on the constant search for food. To a polar bear, anything that moves is considered dinner. So the last thing you would do is go swimming with one, right? Well, everyone but Mark Dumas, as he goes swimming with a polar bear in his own home pool. Surprisingly, though, the polar bear doesn't see Mark as a tasty snack, but instead considers him to be her best friend. That's because the polar bear, called Agi, was actually hand-reared by Mark since she was a cub. Oh, how cute. Agi was originally born in Kolmarden Wildlife Park, Sweden. At the time, Canadian animal trainer Mark was scouting for a young bear to feature in the 1996 movie Alaska, and the park agreed to transfer ownership of Agi to him. Since then, Mark and Agi have formed an unbreakable bond. Agi loves messing around with Mark. The two can even wrestle, but imagine being tackled by an 800-pound opponent. Oof, that would hurt. But Mark's not even worried when Agi wraps her jaws around his throat. Even though her teeth can deliver a colossal 1,200 pounds of force, Mark trusts Agi not to actually bite him because she's been thoroughly trained. Though, I certainly wouldn't take that chance. Agi is also incredibly affectionate, hugging and licking Mark constantly. Their friendship has spanned decades, as Agi is now 23 years old. Though their friendship is unconventional, it's become a symbol for the continued preservation of the species. Polar bears are endangered, listed at a vulnerable status, with only 22,000 to 31,000 animals left in the world. And with the ice caps melting, polar bears are increasingly under threat. Therefore, it's important to preserve this species through conservation efforts, even in radical setups like this one. 
Mod couples like Agi and Mark could end up rescuing polar bears from the brink of extinction, though I wouldn't be accepting any pool party invites from Mark anytime soon. Which of these animal rescue stories did you find the most surprising? And which animal would you like to become best friends with? Let me know down in the comments below, and thanks for watching.